morning and welcome to the third stop on the Road to Regina Paving the Way series. I am Debbie Walker, the District Conference Education Chair. We have a very special guest joining us this morning and I cannot wait to hear what she has to say to us. If you have heard her speak before, you know how inspiring that she is. And she has assured me that today she is going to be speaking from the heart. I have put the agenda into the chat for your reference. With respect to the chat, please do not put any promotion or self-promotional announcements in the chat during today's meeting. If any such announcements do appear, they will be deleted. There will be a 10 minute Q&A session following the speaker's presentation. Should you have any questions for her, please put them into the chat and I will monitor for them. Without any further ado, which is something we're not supposed to say, but my words went right out of my head. I now turn the virtual lectern over to our district conference chair, Leanne Woodhouse. Thank you, Debbie. And thank you everyone for joining us this morning on our third stop on our road to Regina. Today's stop is excellence. Our speaker today joins us from Cape Town, South Africa. What does it take to be first? In 2005, Verity started her journey as a first South African musician, crazy enough to get 2,000 people to buy an album she hadn't even recorded yet. In 2021, she became the first speaker from South Africa and the sixth woman in history to be crowned the world champion of public speaking. Then in 2023, she topped that by becoming the first speaker from Africa and the first female world champion to earn her accredited speaker designation. Verity's passion is to helping people be the author of their own story. Today, she's going to share with us what she believes her secret to success in Toastmasters and in life. Please join us in welcoming Verity Price, The Secret to Success in Toastmasters. Thank you so much, Leanne, and thank you, Debbie. What a, what a warm welcome. I, I do feel like I need to jump on a plane and come and visit you all soon because doing this on Zoom just doesn't quite cut it, but I am so excited to be here. And when Debbie reached out and said, Verity, will you come and speak on the series that we're putting together, The Road to Regina? Firstly, I was blown away by that ingenuity, by this value add to your district. And of course I said yes. And then when she said, will you speak on the theme of excellence? I said an even bigger yes, because if you look at the Toastmasters values, and I was kind of just sitting with this while I was thinking about being with you today and thinking about the fact that, you know, it's respect and service and integrity and excellence. And I would venture to say that close on 100% of people who join Toastmasters are joining initially for the value of excellence. They are there to become more. They're trying to improve as speakers, as leaders, and they want to have an experience of excellence in their own life, in their own personal growth. So that's my question to you. And we can just pop this in the chat. I love this to be interactive. Are you in Toastmasters because you are trying to excel? You are trying to create and experience more excellence in your life. I see Stephanie getting the chat going saying, absolutely, is she the only one? Uh, let's see if we can find our, our chat box going and I see some yeses coming in. Absolutely, we're here because we want excellence. And so then I think it would be safe to say it's because we want to experience success. Whatever success is to you, it's like, what is that success? How do I want it to look in my life? And I'm fascinated by this concept of success because people often ask me, Verity, what's the secret? How have you achieved what you've achieved? And when I looked back over my career and over my time in Toastmasters, I started to realize that any success 
that I'd experienced, anything I'd excelled in came down to one thing. It came to one thing that I'd been doing consistently. And every time I'd done it, it had led to something which had led to something which had led to some of the things you see behind me on the wall there. So what is that one thing? Because the exciting thing about it is it's something you have been doing since you learned to talk. It's something you do every day. You do it often. But what matters is when you do it and what you do it for. And so I want to take you on a journey of how we can experience more success in our lives and by default, be excellent in everything we do. And to take you on that journey, I'm going to have to take you back to January 2011, because that was the first time I ever went to a Toastmasters meeting. My elder sister, Kay, who is 12 years older than me, she reached out to me in the December and said, you know, I've joined this thing called Toastmasters because she was terrified of public speaking, absolutely terrified. I said, oh, that's amazing. Hopefully that will help you. Because at that point, I was already speaking and singing professionally. I'd long overcome my issues with nerves. And there's a whole story about that. And so when she called me up again in the January and said, I'm doing a thing called an icebreaker at my club. Will you come and support me? Of course, I said, yes, you know, I'm a, I'm a good sister. So I went and I went with no expectations. I didn't know what Toastmasters was. I had done no research on it. And uh, to put it in perspective, the club that my sister had joined was in a little fishing town called Fishhook, bottom of Cape Town. It's almost as far south as you can get in Africa. And the, the best thing I can say about Fishhook is that it's the retirement capital, of South Africa. So I went in in my mid 30s, not expecting much, especially since the meeting was in a library hall. It wasn't very cool. I'm just going to put it out there. It wasn't very cool. So I kind of walked in going, I don't know what this is going to be about. And within minutes of walking into that meeting, I was getting this feeling of like, wow, I, I think I've stepped into something special here. People were so warm. They were so welcoming. And more was how they were treating my sister who was about to do her first speech. I saw members going up and telling her, you've got this, you're going to be amazing, patting her on the back, giving her a glass of water. I thought, gosh, this is, this is different. This is special. And then I watched her stand up and give that speech with a quivering voice and shaking legs. And when she finished speaking, I was kind of taken aback when the entire club stood up and gave her a standing ovation. And I was like, wow, wow. And the little old lady sitting next to me said, we do this every time someone does an icebreaker. And in that moment, I had a yes feeling about Toastmasters. And so during the break, when someone said to me, would you like to do an impromptu speech? And I was like, what's that? And they gave me, you know, told me about table topics. I said, yes, try. And I did my best. And I'm, I'm not sure if this is a club strategy, but I won best table topics that night. And I know membership often uses this as a good strategy to get guests in. Because at the end of the meeting, when the president came up to me and, and the vice president membership came up to me and said, would you like to join our club? I said, yes. Now, here's the thing about that one word that you have been saying since you were born. You say it every day. We don't often know when yes is about to change our life. Unless someone is proposing to you and you know that is a significant yes, there are so many other little yeses that when we say them, we don't know that our whole life is about to change. And so I stepped into Toastmasters with no expectations. My second yes to Toastmasters came three months into being a member when our president approached me in the parking lot on the way into a meeting and said, Verity, the committee and I have been talking about you, and we think you could add value to this club. Now, if you want to know something about me, if someone says, we've been talking about you, we think you could add value, I'm already saying yes to whatever you're about to ask. So when he said, would you join the committee? I said, yes. And then I said, well, what am I doing? What's my job? I probably should have asked that first, because I had said yes to being the club treasurer, and I am terrible with numbers. 
because I'd said yes, and because I'm committed to stepping up and doing whatever I've said I will do, I shared with the committee I wasn't great with maths. They said, we'll support you. And I stepped into the stretch that that yes was asking of me. I had to learn how to use Excel properly. I had to learn how to invoice people, how to ask for money. And it was a real challenge and it was a real stretch. But the yes I'd said to it meant I had to step into what that yes was expecting of me. And I actually discovered I quite enjoyed it. I started getting much better at sending out invoices, being quite on top of my admin. And when the first club dues cycle came around and it was now my job to get the club to say yes to rejoining, to get the members to pay, I encountered my first experience of really communicating to persuade. And I thought, I have a choice here. I can either stand up at the club meeting and say, come on guys, it's dues time, please pay your dues, I'm sending you an invoice, and have a transactional experience with them, it was a choice. Or I could say yes to trying to do the treasury role a little bit differently and to try and excel at it. And so I decided, to share a story with them of how I went to a non-conventional school where we never got prizes, we never got badges, we never got certificates, we never got trophies. And I shared the story with the club and I said, I've just found out I've got an opportunity to get a ribbon, a treasurer's excellence ribbon that our district gives if you pay all your dues across before the middle of March or I think the middle of September. And so I said, I'd love it if you could help me get a ribbon. I need 20 members paid across by the middle of March. And blow me down. They paid. We got the Treasurer's Excellence Award. And they kept saying yes every time I would stand up. And I was treasurer for about three years. They, they kept asking me to be treasurer. But it was incredible to see how just choice, a different choice in communication could get yeses from other people. The third yes that I said in Toastmasters was to competing in a contest. At the beginning of 2012, they said, we've got a club contest, do you want to enter? I said, yes. Now, I'm gonna be honest, it was an arrogant yes. I was already a professional speaker. I thought, this will be easy. And so I did what a lot of people do when they say an arrogant yes to something or a comfortable yes. I left it till the day before to work on my speech. Hey, my sister, on the other hand, said yes, because it was a stretch. She said yes, because she wanted to excel as a, as a speaker. And so she worked on her club contest speech for a month. And I felt a little sorry for her, seeing how hard she was working. And I sauntered in on the night thinking, this is going to be easy. You might get a sense of where my story's going. My sister beat me. And that was when I discovered that I hadn't entered a club contest in Fishhook at the bottom of Africa. I'd entered the international speech contest and my lazy, arrogant yes had resulted in nothing. Her committed yes resulted in her going from club to area to division to being the third woman to ever win in our district in 56 years with the sixth speech she'd ever given in her life. She was a brand new Toastmaster, but she was so committed to excelling at speaking that she watched every world champion. She read every book. She worked with mentors. She worked with coaches. And I sat humbled watching her progress all the way to the world semifinals, where she came second to Ryan Avery, who two days later became the world champion. It was inspiring, and it was also deeply humbling to watch Kay's journey, to see that when someone steps into the stretch, the real stretch of a yes, facing their fears, facing their nerves, facing their anxiety, that it could take them all the way to the semi-final stage. <clears throat> At that point, said no <laughs> to competing. My ego was so confronted by A, that my sister had beaten me and she was a novice speaker, B, she'd gone all the way to the semifinals and C, how much work it took to win at contests. So at that point, I started saying yes to leadership at any opportunity. I said yes to doing public relations for our club. I said yes to becoming president. And in 2015, I said 
a stretching yes to becoming a division director, having never been an area director. They were struggling to find someone to step into the role. And so I'd seen how saying yes to the treasury role had grown me. And in fact, saying yes to that had improved my business. I'd gotten better at invoicing my clients and asking for money. So I was seeing that what I was doing in Toastmasters was transferring into the rest of my life. And so when they said, do you want to be division director? I said, yes, that sounds challenging, but I, I'm going to take the stretch that the yes will bring to me. Now, I know I'm sure there's a lot of people here tonight that are in leadership roles in Toastmasters that have stepped in. And you might have found what I found stepping into a big leadership role is, again, you are faced with a choice. Do you just do the job, what's required, follow the manual, do your thing for a year and finish and hand over to someone else because that's a viable choice? Or do you look at the role and go, what is the legacy I want to leave? What's the impact I want to make? What's the difference I want to create? That's the choice I made in 2015. And it wasn't about growing clubs. It wasn't about any of the things that Toastmasters tells leaders to do. And of course, I was going to do all of those. But for me, the thing that I wanted to change in my division was something that I had noticed Back in 2012, when I went to my first ever division contest when Kay was competing. So bear in mind, I was a brand new Toastmaster. I'd only been there a year and a bit. And when I got to the division contest, it was the first time I realized we had areas and we had four areas in our division. But at the contest, there were only speakers from three areas. And so I asked the obvious question, where's the speaker from the fourth area? I said, oh, well, you know, the fourth area is actually in Namibia, completely different country, 800 kilometers away. And for some reason, we were at the bottom of Africa. They were a neighboring country, and it was too expensive for them to ever come to our division contests. So their members never had an opportunity to shine on a division stage. And that did not sit well with me. That was a big no. I am saying no to that. I want to change that. And so in 2015, I sat down with my area directors and I shared with them that I had a vision of us raising money through the division to bring the area members from Namibia to compete. Luckily for me, they said, yes, let's go for it. They went and spoke to their club presidents, shared the vision. They said, yes, let's go for it. I reached out to Namibia and said, we don't want you to ever miss out on being in a contest. They were like, yes, we will do this. And for three months, I watched an entire division come together to raise the money so that their contestants could be at our contest. I'd love to tell you that one contestant made it that year, but no. Not only did they represent in all three contests, impromptu evaluations and international speech contest, but 12 other Namibian members came with them. They hired a bus. They did a two day road trip to be with us. And the division champion that year was from Namibia. He was amazing. We would never have seen him if the entire division hadn't said yes to changing something that we could have just left well alone. People often say to me when they're interviewing me in, in these amazing meetings around the world, they say, Verity, clearly your highest achievement in Postmasters was winning the world championships. And I go, you know what? It's changed my life, but that is not the thing I'm proudest of. The thing I am proudest of is that we brought Namibia to that contest and we changed the face of our division through that, so much so that their club started growing. Namibia is now a separate division that is at our district contests every single year. So that was that was my highlight of Toastmasters. If I had to, to put a tick on excellence for me, that was it. Because the next yes that I said wasn't to Toastmasters. It was to getting married. When my... <clears throat> Husband proposed, let me tell you, and you're 43 years old, uh, I had been waiting many years to say yes. So when he got down on one knee, I was like, yes, yes. And within a month, 
with the help of some incredible doctors. So this was in, in 2018, uh, we managed to fall pregnant. So from 2015 to 2018, all I'd really been doing was leadership. Wherever I could lead, wherever I could help, wherever I could find clubs, that's what I'd been doing. I had competed in evaluations in 2015. I've been lucky enough to become the district champion, but I'd been focused on leadership. And now I was focused on getting married and focused on becoming a mom. But as I was facing early pregnancy and realizing that my journey with Toastmasters was coming to an end, it occurred to me that I didn't want to leave this organization with a big, like unchecked checkbox. And that was to become a distinguished Toastmaster. I'd managed to tick off all the leadership roles. I had done a high performance leadership project, which was getting Namibia to that contest, but I'd only done 15 speeches. This is embarrassing. In six years, I'd only done 15 speeches. And we know a lot of us do this. We forget that we're there to grow as speakers. So I said yes to finishing 25 speeches before I gave birth to my little boy. So I had six months to waddle into clubs, heavily pregnant, nauseous in the beginning, any club that would have me, nothing was online at that point. I would sometimes visit a breakfast club in the morning and a club in the evening, delivering different speeches. What was incredible was it taught me to write speeches quickly. It taught me to look into my life and find stories that I could turn into speeches that fitted the projects that I was doing. And it taught me to think on my feet, to adapt, to be able to stand up, even if it wasn't perfect, but I'm going to do a speech. I'm not going to procrastinate anymore. And I delivered my final distinguished Toastmasters speech two weeks before my son Dominic was born. I was huge. I had a belly. It looked like I was having twins. But I had to think about what's the talk I want to give as my final speech in Toastmasters. And I decided to share a story about my mum and how she always used to pick up litter on beaches, driving me mad as a teenager, and share with me that I should leave the world better than I find it. And I chose to share how, in the time I'd had in Toastmasters, I tried to live her motto. If you've seen my semi-final speech, you might get a sense of just where a speech can start. I delivered that speech, and I said goodbye to Toastmasters, and hello to becoming a mom. And quite honestly, if it was up to me, that's where this story would end right now. But life had other plans. In 2020, we were thrust into lockdown, into the chaos of COVID. And right at the start of COVID, I got a call from a club that I had chartered when I was division director saying, we're shutting our doors. We've only got six members. We can't keep doing this. And you see, sometimes you have to say no. I was like, no, you are not shutting your doors. I'm rejoining Toastmasters. I'll be your president. Let's turn this club around. And luckily for me, those six members said, yes, let's do this. And we were now in new territory of being virtual. And I said, the quickest way we're going to turn around this club around is to have an event like today that has people that come to us. And so I reached out to a world champion, Lance Miller who I'd met in 2015 when I was a division director, when he'd come to South Africa to visit our district, I'd hosted him in Cape Town. And I said, Lance, could you do us a favor? Would you do an event for us? He said, yes. We publicized that event. 200 people showed up online to hear Lance speak at our club that had six members. Now, bear in mind, this was early lockdown. It was easy to get 200 people online. They were stuck at home. They had nothing else to do. But at the end of that meeting, we had 16 new members. So we did it again with a top South African comedian. At the end of that meeting, we had six new members and suddenly our club was back on track. Now, the next thing I needed to say yes to was an uncomfortable yes. Those of you who've been Toastmasters for a while might join me on this, but I realized if I was gonna be a member again, I needed to speak, which meant I needed to say yes to Pathways. I was a legacy member. So I signed up for visionary communication and I signed up to do an icebreaker. So I thought, what do I speak about? What do I do as an icebreaker? I've done so many speeches at Toastmasters. So I did what you should sometimes think about doing. I went back through old speeches and what did I find? My DTM speech. I rewrote it as an introduction of who I was to this club. And 
When I finished giving it with the message that my mom had shared to me to always leave the world better than I found it, I got off the call and I thought, yeah, it would be a contest speech. And a second later, a voice said, and you could win. You could get to the world finals. Got goosebumps. I felt, who am I to think that's even possible? And another part of me said, who are you not to? And I decided in that moment of November 2020 that I was going to enter and I was going to see if it was possible for someone from Africa to win this contest, for another woman to win this contest. And I said yes to the hard work that was needing to go into that. Because I realized I couldn't approach it with the 2012 attitude Verity had. I had to approach it with Kay's 2012 attitude. I had to follow world champions. I had to reach out for coaching. And so I said yes to the stretch that that championship was going to require of me. Now, I'm not gonna take you through the story of it because you know how the story ends. Like spoiler alert, you can see behind me. I was incredibly lucky that that yes, resulted in the success of actually winning the contest. And it has changed my life to become a world champion. But what hit me after I won was that the yes I said to competing is not the yes that matters. The yes that mattered was the first yes in 2011 when I said yes to joining this organization. And it was every successive yes after that, that led to the ultimate success and the excellence that I was able to experience as a speaker through the International Speech Contest. So you're sitting here right now, and I hope you're kind of looking back over your life going, where has yes made a difference for me? Or where would yes take me to? Because truly in Toastmasters, the excellence that we experience in the way we run our clubs, the way we deliver our speeches, the way we lead those that serve that serve in, these, in this organization, that comes down to when we say yes to a role, yes to a speech, yes to a challenge, yes to mentoring someone. Those are the yeses that lead to any excellence you, I, or anyone is going to experience in this organization. And I truly believe that yes speaks to all of these, all the values in our incredible organization. Yes to being integral, yes to being respectful, yes to service, yes to excellence. And so I really want you to sit with the fact that the yes you say today to whatever it is that you know is going to stretch you, challenge you, shape you, change you, the yes you say today will lead to the success and the excellence you experience tomorrow. And so on that note, I want to invite you to ask me any questions you want, anything I can do to help, to share, to give more insight, because I'm so excited to be here. And let's hear what you have for me. I know I'm on 25 minutes, so I'm giving you 15 minutes of questions. Thank and I'm you. going to mute to blow my nose because you don't want to hear that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Verity. Lo loved everything that you shared and the connection between how saying yes can lead to excellence. To our members, we have a longer time for a Q&A. Please feel free to put your questions into the chat. I am monitoring for them. We do have one question already. The comment is, Verity, I love your speaking style. Very personal and engaging. How would you encourage someone to participate in a contest and what would you say are the benefits of competing? Oh, what a great question. So here's my thing about contests and it's the bottom line. In a contest, only one person is ever guaranteed to win. Only one person is going to win any contest from club all the way to the world finals. But every other speaker who enters a contest is guaranteed to grow. And so my motivation to anyone who's thinking of competing is you've got to enter for the growth. The win we cannot guarantee. And, and we've all sat through enough contests to know that the results don't always feel like, mm, is that the exact result? We're not sure. Does it feel the speaker was shortchanged? We don't have control over that. But if you enter to grow, to stretch yourself, to say yes 
to working harder on a speech than you would work on any other normal speech. Because let's be honest, a contest speech gets a lot more attention than a club speech. So I would say, say yes to the stretch and to the growth you're going to experience as a speaker. The winning is wonderful, but I, I don't know who it was. I saw somewhere on Facebook saying, you can go and buy a trophy. You can go buy, if you want a trophy, go buy a trophy. You can't buy the growth. And that's why I believe we should enter contest is for the growth to stretch ourselves, to push ourselves a little further, because excellence, in my opinion, is on the other side of the push. So choose the push and see who you become as a result. Thank you very much. I see much. questions about table topics, humorous speeches. Yeah, um, questions are So coming. I have, I'll just quickly answer that one to Marvin. I have, I was very lucky in 2019, actually, when I was heavily pregnant, I did table topics at district where I came second. I was very grateful with pregnancy brand that I came anywhere. In 2012, so after losing to my sister in club, and later that year they had the humorous contest and I entered and managed to go all the way to second in district. But you'll see, you'll notice I'll come second in district and go, good enough. I never entered any of those contests again. I enjoyed them. Uh, I loved the humorous because it pushed me outside of my natural speaking style to find more humor and and table topics I just love that you have to trust yourself you have to trust that your brain is going to deliver something in the moment uh, and and similarly with evaluations to sit and listen to someone's speech and trust that I'm going to hear what I need to hear and give them what they need in these seven minutes and the five minutes I have to write my notes so I would say yes to people competing in all the contests as a way to grow Another question for you is, how can someone overcome their fear of vulnerability to speaking, both in contests and in the club? Hmm. So the, that, is a, that is a big one. And at that point, I think that's where having a mentor or a coach really helps. I, I And I'm very lucky. One of the things that came out of this journey and becoming world champion is I do get to coach people. Now, often I'm coaching very competent speakers, but I also will have people in big corporate jobs, nothing to do with Toastmasters, who will reach out to me because they can't say boo to a mouse in a meeting. And through having someone working with you one-on-one, -on -one, boosting you, telling you what your strengths are, giving you exercises to do, showing you conversationally that you can speak. Look, you just told me that story. That was amazing. Now you're going to do that in front of people, but you can do it. That is what needs, if you're really struggling to overcome that vulnerability, is find someone. And this doesn't have to be a paid coach. I always need to be very clear. I love the people pay me for coaching, but find a mentor. Find someone who's in your corner who you can practice with. That's what slowly starts building the confidence muscle. And confidence is a muscle. It gets bigger the more you do stuff. I truly believe we fear the things we cannot do. And as we learn, we do more and we fear less. So find someone to be on that learning path with you. And that should start shifting the vulnerability and bringing it to a place of courageous vulnerability. So you can stand up and you can speak. Thank you very much. The questions continue to flow. I see you've got your work, your work cut out for you, Debbie. I do indeed. All right, here, here's the next one. I'm taking them all in order as they appear in the chat. The question is, do you think leadership roles in either the club or the district levels helps you improve speaking skills? And if so, how? Absolutely. One of my, actually, that's the answer to the previous question. If you're nervous, become the sergeant at arms because you're going to have to speak at the start of every meeting and after every break. And I have watched incredibly nervous people through the sergeant at arms role build their confidence. In fact, our president now at my club, who happened to be my next door neighbor, you should never live next door to me because I'll make you join Toastmasters and then say, join the committee. Because uh, I, know, I know the growth that comes with it. I've watched her grow as a speaker because she keeps having to do her address at the start of every meeting. So absolutely, if you choose to not just do transactional communication of, hi guys, welcome to the meeting. I hope you have a great time because that's not a great choice. 
but rather choose to go, let me speak to the theme. Let me bring a little bit of story, a little bit of humor so that I'm building my speaking ability through leadership. That's how my speaking grew in Toastmasters. I was always doing leadership talks, which I wasn't ticking off as Toastmasters talks, but it improved my communication. So 100%, 100%. Wonderful. Next question is, how do you decide how much truth needs to be in a speech and how much is fabricated for effect? I will, and I will paraphrase, I know it's Craig Valentine and also Darren LaCroix say this, there, there, there's the emotional truth that needs to be there. We, we don't want to fabricate to the point that none of it's true. So often, you'll put a scene together that might not have exactly happened that way, but if it's a collection of many experiences you've had and I'm putting it into a scene so the audience can see it and they're not going to have to contend with me sharing seven memories, I think that's fine. And I can give an example from my world championship speech when I said, you know, that friend, I, and I, I said I ran into her in a supermarket buying ice cream. That scene did not happen exactly like that. But I had had hundreds of encounters with girls I went to school with in various settings at parties and at seeing them in the supermarket, but it wasn't that scene exactly. But I'd had the experience of everyone telling me how amazing their lives were and me going, oh, I'm just not there yet. So that for me is, is it an emotionally true scene of something you've experienced? You're not making it up just to have an emotional impact on the audience. Um, but as far as possible, follow the truth but leave out the details that aren't necessary. And, and that's where I think we also get lost is you cannot let the facts ruin a good story. You've got to just find the chunks of scenarios that are going to tell the story, leave out the other data. Thank you very much. Your next question is, how do you find the premise of the speech you want to give as well as the foundational phrase? Huh. So it depends. It depends on the process. Often I'm starting with a story or an experience I've had and I write that up just as a little scene or a scenario. And then I sit with it and I go, what is this? What is this saying? Like, what is the point of this? And, and that's maybe where we start with the premise of it. You know, here I'm talking about forgiveness or I'm talking about self-love, whatever it is. The foundational phrase takes more time. Uh, my semi-final speech, I was lucky because my mom always said, leave the world better than you find it. So I never had to think about that. My final speech uh, was my dad in his letter actually said, work on an attitude of gratitude, polish your goals daily and watch for a miracle. I started with work on an attitude of gratitude. It irritated some audience members. So I had to keep chipping away and what am I trying to say? What was dad really teaching me? And eventually I landed on write a different story, but it's a journey. And again, it's often one we can't do by ourselves. Have another set of ears or eyes on your speech and see what they give back to you and then work with that. The next question is, my, big, my biggest challenge is that there are too many wonderful things to say yes to, especially in Toastmasters. Every yes to one thing is a no to something else. Mm. How do you know that you are saying yes for the right reasons? And how do you choose what to say yes to? Gosh, that is a, a great question and, and completely spot on. So I think you do... You have to have your own personal boundaries in place, and that's where knowing what your values are and, and what you're capable of committing to. So right now in Toastmasters, I can only say yes to serving at a bigger level. I'm actually still treasurer of my club uh, because they needed one. But everything else I sadly have to say no to because I don't have capacity as, you know, I've got a four-year-old child, I work full-time. So I say yes where I know I can serve best. And maybe that's the the line that you should choose is to look at them and go where will I serve best what's the yes that will help me serve best and start there because by saying no you are opening the space for someone else to say yes and it's it's trusting that so I don't know if that fully answers your question it's a great question but for me it's definitely where can I serve best that's where I'm going to hold my yes energy Thank you very much. The next question is, 
During contest season between club contest area division, how many times do you change up the speech, whether it is the wording or the lines? And did you have professional coaching during that journey? So I wrote 32 versions of each of my speeches. If you want to know change up, I worked an average of two to four hours a day in the last three months. It was intense. I acted like I was going to the Olympics. I stopped changing the speeches about five days before each major contest. Uh, sometimes I was doing, still doing some tweaks, but the speeches were so internalized I could. And yes, I did have coaching. So I reached out to Lance Miller because I knew him. He was the only world champion I knew. And I love his speech, The Ultimate Question. And he was incredibly generous with his time and, and energy with coaching me. Next <clears throat> question. In selecting a topic for a speech, are there topics or areas of life that receive greater attention? No. No, it's how you tell the speech. And I've said this on many platforms. You could tell the story of how you learned to boil the, an egg and you would become world champion if you did that well. So no, it comes down to the storytelling. It comes down to the energy. Jocelyn won last year talking about, you know, competing in a triathlon. Other people would say, oh no, there needs to have been a death or cancer. No, there are no rules about what the speech is about. It needs to be a universally connecting topic where people can see themselves but you could speak about anything it's can you tell that story well and is there a message of value for the audience thank you very much there was a question in the chat about what is key to choosing a topic that has a global message but I think you touched on that or did you want to add a little bit more on that I think it's it's anything that human beings go through. So it's looking at the big emotions, love, hurt, anger, betrayal, trust, pride, you know, self-love. If, you, if you're tying into those things, you're starting to get universal. You just need to be sure that you, you're not creating a, a gender gap. And I say that, and I know we, we live with many different genders now, but I'm specifically talking male, female. My first versions of my world champion speech were very much about a 40 year old woman who was miserable and wish she was married. It was not connecting to the men in the audience. So I had to spend more time on the story of my father and how he lost a job and how he wrote a different story so that I was speaking to everyone. So just look at, is my story too specific to me and where I come from? And then work out how to make it a little bit more global. Wonderful. One last question for you. You've been talking about building scenes as you develop your speeches. Can you share a little bit more about that on building scenes? Ah, <clears throat> well, I suppose each little scene is a, is a story. And I'm just, because it's front of mind, if you, and you can go and watch my world championship speech if you haven't seen it. I create a scene where I'm in a bedroom eating ice cream, watching Netflix. That's a short scene. Then there's a scene at a supermarket where I run into a friend who I don't want to see. Then we go back to the spare room and there's a scene where I find a letter from my dad. So these are short scenes that are very easy for people to see. And then from there, I actually start talking about the change and it becomes far more of a speech and taking people through the message. So scenes are very short moments in time that you can throw your audience into. And you can have one entire scene as the whole speech and Aaron Beverly's uh, unbelievable story 2019 when was that the whole speech was a wedding but there were scenes of arriving being given some shoes fighting for the shoes people jumping on him that's what I mean by scenes and you can perfect a speech by perfecting each scene wonderful thank you very much that concludes the Q&A session Thank you to everyone in the audience for the level of engagement and peppering Verity with questions and making her really work for it. She had so much valuable insight to share. It is wonderful. Verity, I will turn it back over to you now for your closing comments and final thoughts for our audience. Well, firstly, my heart is full. It's been so lovely to spend this time with all of you. And Definitely to hear there's obviously always going to be more questions to me about speaking than there will be about leadership. But I believe that both aspects in Toastmasters make us better people. 
And so, yes, I think need to your yeses so that you're not stretched so thin. Say yes where you can serve, but say yes where you can be stretched. Those, those are the two yeses that I think will take you forward in life to becoming the version of you that you want to be. Where can I serve? Where can I stretch myself so that I become more? And this is in leadership. It's looking at a role going, I know this is how it's normally done. Can I do it better? Can I add a spin? Can I add something that becomes my legacy? And in a speech going, this is how I always approach them. Can I reach out to someone else to help me shift my normal way of doing things? And it's saying yes to that. It's saying yes to I want to do it differently. And, and I know that because when Lance Miller was coaching me, I didn't want to say yes to him in our first coaching call. I didn't pick up my pen and write anything down for the first 30 minutes because I was uncomfortable with what he was asking me to change. And it was only when I said, Verity, he knows more than you. Start listening. Stop being arrogant. And I picked up my pen and I started writing notes and I said yes to becoming a better speaker that's when I became a better speaker. And so I really believe that your yes is what's going to lead to your excellence. Choose the yeses wisely. Yes, where you can serve. Yes, where you can be stretched and see what success and excellence that leads you to. And then please keep in touch with me on social media. Tell me what happens. Um, I'd love to hear what happens. And is for everyone here, if you're not engaged with me or spend time with me online I'd love you to join me I'll even change my virtual background because I think it has all my details on it there you go um, at Verity Price Speaks if you want to join me on Instagram or LinkedIn or Facebook I've always tried to share tips and tricks to help you become the best speaker that you can be and veritypriced.com, you can sign up for my free newsletter. I send one out every two weeks with tips and tricks that you can quickly and easily apply to your speaking. So I really hope that, that you will join me and then you can keep in touch and tell me what success you are experiencing, what excellence you are leaning into. But really, when you leave here today, think about the next yes you say and think about, I wonder where this is taking me. Thank you so much, Debbie. Thank you. It is just such a joy to be with you all. Thank you so very, very much. Always love hearing what you have to say. I don't know if the audience noticed, but when Verity presents, it comes across as very natural. Now, I had the opportunity to coach with her, and I realized something about her when I was coaching with her. Because she comes across so natural, I kid you not, if you were to write a speech, your own words, and give it to her to read, she can deliver that on the very first try, most naturally, as if she had written it herself. That is the level that she is at. It's amazing. It's incredible. And it is something that I have never forgotten. Verity, that is from my heart to yours. I probably never Thank shared you. that with you. But... You're hearing it now. You're hearing it today. So appreciate your time coming and sharing with us, sharing with the audience, sharing from the heart. It means everything. Now, moving on, we have quite a few announcements to share with you today with respect to the upcoming conference and believe it or not, the final installment of the Road to Regina Paving the Way series. Mark your calendars. For Saturday, April 13th, 10 a.m. Saskatchewan time, 10 a.m. Alberta time, you can go to the District 42 website, go to the events calendar and register for the Zoom link. Who is taking us home at the end of the road to Regina? Believe it or not, it is none other than the 2023 world champion of public speaking, Jocelyn Tyson. She will be here joining us live from, I believe she lives in the United States, and she will be covering the core value of respect. We are very honored to have her and excited. Share the news, tell everyone, let's get a good crowd out for the final installment of this project. The next announcement. This one came as a little bit of a surprise a few weeks ago. Due to unforeseen circumstances, our Saturday keynote speaker, Darren LaCroix, 
is unable to attend our conference in person, but he was committed to helping us still have a world champion live in Regina on the stage to network and interact and present to all of us. Within 24 hours, we had another person lined up, also from the Las Vegas area. If you have not heard of him before, he was world champion in 2000, the year before Darren was. Ed Tate is going to be joining us. He is going to be flying into Regina on Friday, with us Friday evening and all day Saturday before he leaves Saturday morning. If you're not familiar with Ed, by all means, Google him. Listen to some of his speeches, get to know what, what his face looks like so that when you come to Regina, you know who he is. So very excited. Uh, unfortunate for Darren that he's unable to attend, but he took care of us and looked after us to make sure that we still had a world champion at the conference. In terms of the conference, Friday night speaker is going to be former Senior Vice President of Business Experience at Farm Credit Canada, Chris Taschuk. Last year, he summited Mount Kilimanjaro, and Friday night he is going to be sharing with us his journey on that and the lessons that he learned. There is so much to be learned in the world of adventure and the world of sport, important leadership principles he will be sharing with us. And then taking us home on Sunday morning will be our international director, Kim Myers. We'll be here live in person in Regina to carry us away at the end of the conference. In terms of workshops, we have one workshop presenter for Saturday afternoon. Don Thomas Cameron of the Downtowners Club in Regina is going to be giving a presentation on how to take a speech and turn it into a book. When I heard her topic, I was immediately interested. Cannot wait to hear what she has to say and what she has to share with us. We have a fabulous lineup. It is all set and you're not gonna wanna miss it. On that note, I turn it over to our district conference chair, Leanne Woodhouse for further announcements and to take us home for today, Leanne. Thank you, Debbie. Before I get into those further announcements, I would like to thank you for organizing this incredible series, Our Road to Regina, and thank you, Verdi, for joining us today. The power of yes, your, your secret. It's such a small world word, but it's got so much power in it. Um, you're an inspiration for not only what you've achieved in Toastmasters, but how enthusiastically and passionately you share your journey with us, especially in a month that we're celebrating International Women's Day. And as a treasurer for my club, I'm going to take your hint and suggestion down and put it into practice. So just further to the conference, um, registration is opening up very, very shortly for the conference. It's, all the information on the conference is on the D42 website. If you open up the site at d42tm.org, go to the right-hand side of the menu bar, you'll see the conference tab. They'll have the full agenda and all the information on the wonderful speakers and presenters Debbie just spoke about. I encourage you, our host hotel is the Double Tree in Regina, and they are offering us a special rate of $119, uh, which includes a full breakfast in their restaurant. I encourage you to sign up early. There's a link to the reservation page or a code that you can use when you call in. The special rate in the block of rooms is only available to the end of March and there is a limited number available. So please register early. For those of us, those of you who will be joining from Calgary, Daisy Way is organizing a bus so that you can travel in comfort and ease. The bus will be picking people up in Calgary and we'll also make a stop on the road in Medicine Hat to pick up anyone who's interested there. One final announcement and more of a challenge. Do you have a hidden talent that you'd like to share with the world? Are you a singer? Are you a dancer? Do you juggle? Maybe you've got a wicked comedic streak that's going to have us all rolling in the aisles. I encourage you to sign up for D42's Got Talent. While Simon Cowell unfortunately is not able to join us, we will have some 
wonderful judges and a very welcoming and enthusiastic audience to see if you can earn that golden buzzer and some great prizes. So again, check out all this information on the D42 website and we look forward to seeing you in Regina. And thank you again to Debbie Walker, our education chair for organizing and taking us on this journey in the road to Regina and for Verity Price for joining us today. Thank you and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you everyone Thank for you coming, so, much. so appreciated.